preach uh, much. I'm just going to bring a little short, uh, call it nail it down thought here tonight. So take your Bible and turn to Psalms, the book of Psalms, and uh, we'll start there this evening. And uh, somebody want to jump up and say something right quick? You feel uh, free to do that right now. Amen. Oh, let's see. I'm Bible not. Says, Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Right. I'm saying so tonight. Amen, Amen brother. Thank God for July 29th, 1984. David changed my life forever. Amen. The day I got eternal life. And I thank God for that. He's been good to me. Amen, brother. Wife, yes, sir, brother. These grandsons and what they mean to us and carrying the same for their family. Amen. Got a wonderful daughter, wonderful family, wonderful life. Amen, brother. Amen. Somebody else, right quick, jump up, pop off, right quick for the Lord. I'm, I'm not going to take long at all tonight. Be a good time to do it. Never know when your last chance will be. Ain't that right? All right, turn to Psalm 12. Go ahead, brother Randy. Amen. Amen, brother. Me too. Hit man, brother. Somebody else, right quick. Anybody else? Right quick. We're looking at Psalm 12. Go ahead. Amen. Amen, sister. Praise the Lord. That's good. Appreciate that, sis. Anybody else, right quick? Anybody else, right quick? Amen. What about your husband? <laughs> I'm just kidding. Bad, you have to beg somebody to brag on you. I, I, I was going to give you a uh, uh, twenty dollars to go shopping with. Anybody else? Anybody else? Right quick. Amen. All right. Okay. Uh, I want to say we did have uh, a few men volunteer to help go get bus license this morning. So thank the Lord for that. But it, it's always the ones that ain't got license and. Got DUIs and everything else. So I don't know what's wrong with the rest of you guys. But uh, I don't know. Let's let the Lord do it, I guess. I don't know what to tell you. Psalm 12. Psalm 12. Now, tonight we're going to study about the Bible just a little bit. I'm not going to preach. But uh, uh, we're going to do a study on our King James Bible. If you come to this church, you'll hear that mentioned often. That we believe the King James Bible is the Word of God. And it is not like that in most churches. It don't make us any better, uh, it, but it does set us apart uh, from the most churches in town. Here in Psalm 12, I want you to look at verse number 6. The words, not the message, not the general meaning. The words of the Lord are pure words. As silver tried in a furnace of fire, purified seven times. I've even heard that preached that there were seven different purification times the Bible went through. Uh, I can prove all that, but I've heard it preached. Thou shalt keep them. Now, somebody tell me what the them would be referring to. The words. Thou shalt keep them. What? The words. The verse before that. O Lord, thou shalt preserve them. So when we preach, when we preach preservation of Scripture, we're, we got Scripture to back up preaching preservation of the Scripture. Uh, them from this generation forever. So the Lord promised to inspire it. They're pure in verse 6. And he promised to preserve it in verse 7. Now tonight, I want to ask you a question. And I'm going to talk about this, this, this one right here. This text, that's what they call a textus recepta. See that text in, in, in Greek like that, they, they say things backwards. That means receive. See how that looks like a receipt? Like receive. Receive text. That's what you'd say that would be in Greek. Now that's where your King James Bible come from. Where they translated it from this Greek text called Textus Receptus. All the modern versions of the Bible. Every single one of them. Is taken from these two Greek manuscripts called Vaticanus. See how that looks like Vatican? I found over there in a Catholic monastery somewhere. In Sinaiticus. Uh, that's the NIV. That's the New International Version. The New American Standard Version. The American Standard Version. 
the Revised Standard Version, the New World Translation, the Living Bible, the LEB. I've got a stack of them right here. Now, if you went to almost, well, any TV preacher, I don't know of one, one nationally known TV preacher that stands on the King James Bible with the exception possibly of Jimmy Swagger. I, if there's another one, I don't know who that might be. There might be another one. I'm talking about big time nationwide preachers. There's a lot of local guys on local stations. Praise God for that. But almost all other well-known preachers and teachers, all these men, I mean, you're talking uh, T.D. Jakes, George Meyer, all, Rod Parsley, all these people, they believe, they believe this. They believe that the Bible was inspired by God and then it got messed up through the years of translations and now all we have are good translations of it that we can basically trust. Any Bible college in the state of North Carolina with the exception of a few Bible institutes believes that same thing. Any, any college, as a matter of fact, probably 80% of the educated preachers in Burke County believe that very same thing. You don't believe it? Go to the average Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian, uh, Lutheran, Episcopalian, and their, their statement of faith will say this, or something like this. It will say, we believe the Bible is the inspired word of God in the original autographs. That means when Moses wrote it, it was inspired. That also means we don't have that now. All we have is pretty trustworthy uh, copies or translations of that. Now, me and you here at Shining Light Baptist Church, we're what we call Bible believers. And we believe that God not only inspired his word, but kept his word, and that we still have his word now. We believe right now. That, that King James Bible you got in your lap right now, we believe that is the inspired infallible, inerrant God to the English-speaking people in our generation without proven error. And um, so that that uh, is very, very controversial. And we're going to look at a few things about that this evening. Um, you know, it started back in the, in the uh, what they call the Dark Ages. And uh, I'll just give you a little bit. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry by disappointing you tonight. I know people want me to get up here and just preach like I always do. But I, I felt like it might be a good time for us just to maybe hit that nail again once in a while to say why we believe what we believe. Uh, I don't want our young people to go out and say, well, we just believe the King James Bible at our church. And they'll say, well, why? I don't know. That's what Brother Danny said. I, you, you need more than that. You need more than that. You need to be able to have some, at least a little bit. I'm not a Greek scholar, Hebrew scholar. don't want to be. But I have done enough study and, and enough research to convince me of what I'm going to show you tonight. In 1380, a man by the name of John Wycliffe published a Bible, uh, or wrote his translation of the Bible in English. In 1408, the Roman Catholic Synod made it illegal to read the Bible in English. Now, the reason the Catholic Church did that is because they knew if it got out and the average person could read the Bible, that they they'd lose hold and the grip on everybody, scaring them with purgatory and hell, keep the money coming in. So they, they made it illegal to read the Bible in English without permission of a bishop being present. They uh, translated uh, from Latin scripture into English was a crime punishable by the charge of heresy. And you were charged as a heretic. In 1415, John Huss was burned at the stake by order of the Roman Catholic Church because of that. In 1455, the Gutenberg Bible was published, and it was the first book, are you listening, ever to come off of a printing press, type, literal, uh, of a print, that's when it, the printing press was invented, and the first book ever printed was a Gutenberg Bible, y'all. First book ever printed, like, like print in a book, was not Playboy, and it was not Einstein, it wasn't Darwin, and it wasn't some, uh, uh, it was a Bible, that ought to tell you something. That's why God let them invent the printing press. God let them invent the printing press, not so they could print magazines, but to print his word and to publish it. Great was the company of them that published it. In 1517, I'm sorry, 1516, the Textus Receptus was published by Erasmus 
And he'd done it by comparing the various Greek manuscripts. In 1517, Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses on the door of the church in Wittenberg, and that marked the beginning of the Reformation. He was, a, I think he was a Catholic priest, and Martin Luther goes in one day and he said, the just shall live by faith. I can't put up with this junk no more. And he took those theses and went, bam, and nailed them on the church, and that began what's known as the Protestant Reformation. And so... As, that, as time went on, they began to get more and more and more. William Tyndale published the New Testament, and William Tyndale was burned at the stake uh, for his beliefs and what he done. Bloody Mary, in 1555, uh, bans Protestant Bibles, so it gets law. Nobody can have a Bible but, a, but the Catholic Church. And 300 men, women, and children are burned to death for possessing a copy of the Bible. In 1536, uh, I'm sorry, 1566, there's a little boy born. His name was James Stewart. He was born to Mary, Queen of Scots. It, little James was only one year old, 1516, 67, when they crowned him King James of Scotland. Uh, like he did in the Bible, he was a little bitty king. I mean, he didn't really do nothing, but he would heir uh, to the throne when he got old enough. So in 1567, King James of Scotland was made king. And in 1603, that same king, James, is crowned James the first king of England. And when he got on the throne, you see old, old William Tyndale was burned at the stake. And they had him like that. And they set fire to that guy, burned his legs. The fire come up, up like that. And old William Tyndale said this. He said, I want to live to see the day when the plowboy out there in the field knows as much scripture as the Pope in Rome. And brother, he put out that book and they burned him and William Tyndale's last words before he burned to death was, Lord, open the king of England's eyes. Flames burn him to death. And God heard that prayer. In 1603, James is crowned king of England. In 1604, the decree is made for a translation of the scripture. Here it comes. In 1604, it was given. Took from 1604 to 1611. That's seven years. Now I want to say, King James never touched it. King James didn't translate it. They are like 54, I think, of the smartest scholars in the world to work on different portions of the Bible. They met ever so often and compared notes. They were, they were done it from a, what was called like a non-denominational sort of approach. Uh, uh, they, they, they compared their notes. They said, this is what we believe it teaches. They would go translate. They would meet together. They'd translate. They'd meet together. And in 1611, this book finally was finished. Uh, between that time, and 1605, they had what's called the gunpowder plot. And the gunpowder plot was a, was a Catholic hierarchy trying to blow up King James and the British Parliament. And he put gunpowder underneath the, the house, the stage or something, and, and somebody found it out. It blowed him to kingdom come. And he had never even got it done. In 1607, listen to this. In 1607, that's between 1604 and 1611, the colonists arrived here in America and named it Jamestown. Jamestown, Virginia. Named it at James. That means the first, you listen the first permanent English settlement named Jamestown would make King James the founding monarch of the United States of America while this book was being published. All this is no accident. And in 1611, May 2nd, it just came out, and it is the greatest book the world's ever seen. There's been more copies of this book printed than any book that's ever been on planet Earth. There's been more work done with this book right here than any other book that's ever been on planet Earth. There's been more revivals, more souls saved, more missionaries went out under the preaching and teaching of this book than any book that's ever been on planet Earth. There's been sales of over a billion and still with a, like a hundred different translations. Here's a stack of them right here. Uh, this right here is called the message mix, New Testament. This is the New World translation. That's that's the Jehovah's false witnesses. 
This is the new international version, which if you go to most churches in Burke County, most Baptist churches, you'd hear that read and preached from. It's a new international version. I'm going to show you in a minute how it can't even compare with this. This is the everyday Bible. I ain't that, trying to sound, you know, cool so kids will read it. This is good news, America. God loves you. This is the youth Bible. The youth Bible. Trying to get kids to think the Bible's cool and read it. And uh, if, if you went to most churches tonight, right here in Burke County, they would, the preacher um, would, would read from, and if you went to Sunday school, the Sunday school teacher would teach from another different version of the Bible. And what the average person believes is that all these are just an update of this. That's what I thought when I first got saved. When I first got saved, I mean, I had a Bible. We started reading. I went and bought me one and started reading it. And somebody gave me a living Bible and said, here, Danny, you might like this one. And I read it, and I read it. But honest to goodness, I was 18 years old, and I still I didn't feel like I was reading the Bible when I read it. I, when I really wanted the Bible, I got that one instinctively. And I remember those other books, and I thought, and my, my, the guys from college, they went to Appalachian State, come down to Nebo, and we had a youth group, and they helped us a lot. And they said, all it does is change the these and the thous so people can understand it better. You know, I mean, I, well, I, didn't, I didn't get to college, didn't go to Bible college, and I hadn't been saved two weeks before I figured out what thee and thou meant. You know, I say unto thee, uh, thou art, you know, you know, how great thou art. I mean, good night. You know, to be a genius <laughs> uh, to figure out uh, that's lofty, pure English. And there's a lot of words like that in the Bible. Uh, for, for example, they, they always whine about the Bible not being plain enough, not being plain enough, not being plain enough. And you know what they do? This King James Bible has the word hell in it like um, 50 something times. And it's 14 in the Old Testament. This is the New International Version. You know how many times the word hell in the Old Testament New International Version? None. You say, well, what does it say? Sheol, Gehenna, or Gehenna is Greek, Tartarus, Hades, Greek word. There are four words translated hell in the Bible. Gehenna, Hades, Tartarus, and, uh, and Sheol. You ever heard anybody say they come like a bat out of Hades? You know, my, my, my coach used to say that talking about us in basketball, and, and that's what he's talking about. And that was another well, I didn't know that meant hell. I knew what hell meant. And they, they, you mean to tell me that Tartarus is easier to understand than hell? It's easier to understand? Stop the first 15 people you meet in Morgan and on Friday night and say, do you know what Sheol is? And I'm like, what? Well, I don't know. Is that a new restaurant or Japanese place around here? Uh, you, you, say, you don't know what it is. And then you say, do you know what hell is? Oh, yeah, I know what hell is. Uh, it, it's not easier to understand. Now, you say, well, Brother Danny, where I go to church, my pastor uses the NIV. All right, let me show you something. I'm not trying to be negative. I'm not trying to speak bad about your pastor. But let's look at Acts 8, chapter 8, just a second. Look at Acts chapter 8. Take your Bible there. I showed this to a young man the other day. He was come, he came to the youth rally and uh, a young preacher. And they heard that I let young preachers preach on Saturday evening. And this young man come from another state, fine young man. I didn't know him. Uh, but he, he said, he said, can I preach in that Saturday afternoon service? I said, well, well I'll, I can't promise you, but you come on and be ready. And, and then he sent me a text and said, do you allow only the King James Bible? And I said, yes. And he sent me one back and he said, so I can't preach out of my living translation? And I said, no. And, and he, he said, well, that's all I've got. I said, well, we'll let you borrow one if you get to preach. And, uh, and I, he, he, he was saying, why? So at the youth rally, I met a fine young man. He, did, he, run, he went to a Southern Baptist church down in South Carolina. Fine, fine young man. I believe he loved the Lord. And uh, I was talking to three or four people. And I said, uh, look, you want, me, you want me to show you why we don't use nothing but the King James Bible? He said, yeah, yeah. And I was talking to three people over here, and I said, look at Acts 8.37. Look at Acts 8.37. All right, here's a guy getting saved. Here's a guy getting saved. Acts 8.37. They came to the water there in verse 36. Somebody stand up and read verse 37 real loud. So you can do it real loud. Verse 37. Philip said, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. He answered, and I said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Okay, there's where the guy got saved. 
He said, "How? what I got to do to get baptized? And Philip said, well, if you believe with all your heart, you can. And he said, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. That's where the man got saved, right? And he said, I believe it with all my heart. Now, you want me to read that to you in this one? Okay, did you enjoy that? It ain't in here. Verse 37 is not in the NIV. Amen. Show that to you, Pastor. All you people hear this on the red, don't get mad at me. You know why? It's taken from a completely uh, different set of manuscripts. If you got a Bible, even your Schofield Bible, which is a good reference Bible, has in the references in the middle that that verse shouldn't be in there. It's only in the other different other manuscripts, later manuscripts. You mean the man getting saved? The first thing they'll say is, "Well, it don't have to change anything that affects any major doctrine." Well, I would say that getting saved is a is a major doctrine. Right. Don't get no more major than getting saved. And it leaves the verse out. Here, let me read it to you. Now, you read verse 36 with me in, in your Bible. And listen to this. This just sounds like, like Ruckman says, like trying to uh, cut a steak with a butter knife. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, look, here is water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? Blank. No verse 37. 38. And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down to the water and Philip baptized him. So the guy says in this one, I, why can't I get baptized? He said, stop the chariot. And he baptized him. No believing on Jesus. No confession. No nothing. If there was nothing else but that, that's enough reason right there to stick with this one. If there wasn't any other reason that what I just showed you, I don't want to. Look, they can't even count. 36, 38. You know, why didn't they put make 37? Why didn't they make 38, 37? And 38, 39, 38. And 40, 39. And, and be honest. You know why? Because it wouldn't match up. I mean, I showed a lady at run a Christian bookstore one time. I said, uh, she's trying to sell me an NIV. And I said, did you know that the NIV said El Hanan killed a giant? She said, what? I said, it sure does. Look over 2 Samuel 21. Am I, am I right? Or 19? I think it's 2 Samuel. I wasn't planning on doing this, but I'll, I'll go ahead and show it to you. 2 Samuel 21. Yeah, there it is. Uh, 2 Samuel 21, 19. Now, look at 2 Samuel 21, 19. And I showed her this. She said, well, this is what all the preachers in the churches are selling. Big display in it when you went into the Christian bookstore. And I said, uh, it says El Hanan killed a giant. She said, it does. I said, I'll show it to you. Look at verse number 19. 2 Samuel 21, 19. And there was again a battle in Gob. What a place. With the Philistines. Where El Hanan, the son of Jehoragim, a Bethlehemite, slew. What was yours say? The brother of. Now, somebody tell me the difference in what them three words, the brother of. Anybody can see a difference in them three words? They're in italics. Now, look at that real careful. Look at that real close. When something is in italics in your King James Bible, that means it wasn't in that Greek manuscript. You say, well, it's wrong. No, it ain't. No, it's not. They learned how to compare. Hold your finger there now. I ain't done. So if you leave out the brother of, you've got Elhanan, the Bethlehemite, slew Goliath and I said I thought David always, I always thought David killed Goliath and she said that's what I think and I said well he didn't in that and she said I can't believe that I'm amazed and I, she said why don't people know that I said, well they just they take it as being advertised and being the best one out and don't take for granted that's got in there now hold your finger we ain't done with this little story about El Hanan yet you say well brother Danny do you mean to tell me the it's why you bring your Bible to church, not just your phone. First, First Chronicles 20. And uh, look at uh, First Chronicles chapter 20. This same scripture is repeated again. Look at verse, 20, verse 5. First Chronicles 20 and verse 5. And there was war again with the Philistines and El Hanan. Same story here. The son of Jared that slew Lame, the brother of Goliath. And it ain't in italics. 
You know what that means? It was in the Greek. And they stuck it in 1 Samuel to match what the Greek said here. So like Dr. Ruckman says, when in doubt, throw the others out. Well, if the King James Bible said one thing, the modern versions say another, you do well to stick with the old book that God has blessed all these years and had his hand on. There's something special about the King James Bible. It lends itself to, uh, to memorization. You remember, remember Billy Graham when he preached in his later years, he, he, would talk, he, would, he would recommend these other versions and stuff, but you listen to his preaching. When he was preaching, he quoted scripture, he quoted the King James. Because that's what stick Jack Dan Ippy, he memorized the King James. They, all, them guys that, they, all them great guys that know the scripture, when they quote it, they quote King James. Because there's something about the King James Bible that sticks in your heart, in your life. Now, I'm, I'm not going to take a long time here, but let's just think just a second about this thing of law of first mention. There's a, there's a law in, in theology and biblical study, Christianity, called the law of first mention. And that means when a word is mentioned for the first time, many times it sets the stage and precedent for how that word is believed and used throughout history. Take your Bible, turn to Genesis 22. Genesis 22, just a second. We know why that, uh, uh, that El Hanan did not kill Goliath. He killed his brother and it gave his name. So that's why the Bible says study, study, study. Show yourself approved. All right, Genesis 22, and this is no accident. Genesis 22, and let's see here. Uh, uh, let's see here. Uh, the story of Abraham and his son, and somebody help me find it out, where he said uh, uh, the word love there. Where's it at in chapter 22? Does anybody see it? Huh? I thought it did. What's that? Yeah, 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 that's it. I skipped over. I'm sorry. Verse 2. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest. The word love is not in 21, 20, 19, 18, 17, 16, 15, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. The first time the word is mentioned, love is there. And it said, take thy son, thine only son, whom thou lovest. Amen. Amen. Lordy mercy, y'all. Oh, that's a coincidence. No, you might think that that's the only time. It keeps happening over and over. The first time love is mentioned is a man's love for his son and giving him as a sacrifice. And that's throughout history. God so loved the world. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friend. That's what the love, you know what love is? It ain't just stupid Hollywood movies and stuff like that. That's lust. Love is a man loving somebody enough to let his son die for. Him. That's love. That's a biblical definition of love, and it fits throughout history. Just throw you another one at you right quick. We won't, we won't take long. Uh, let's turn to Genesis 14. Genesis 14. Uh, anybody know where the first mention of the word beer is in the Bible? That Brother Derek was talking about this morning. Uh, I think I heard him talking about Budweiser or whatever they're trying to do. I never have I haven't figured out what that all about that is all about. But the word beer, the first time you know what's mentioned it, it means a well. A well. Everybody said, boy, yeah, I drink a well dry. That's, uh, the word beer, that's where it comes from. But they don't know that. Let me show you something here. Uh, Genesis 14 and verse 13. Genesis 14. I'm sorry. 13. Genesis 13. I'm sorry. Genesis 13. 13. Genesis 13. 13. There's the first time you find in the Bible the word wicked or the word sinner. You know what it's talking about? Sodomites. The first mention of wickedness or somebody being a sinner is in Genesis 13, 13. Almost makes you shake and tremble, don't it? Whoa. Something supernatural about this book right here. 
Moses didn't even know there was going to be verses when he wrote that. He had no idea. 1313. 13. You know what the number 13 stands for? Look at chapter 14. That's what I was going to show you a minute ago. Let's skip on up there and get that. Look at verse tw- uh, 4. Genesis 14, 4. Twelve years they served Chedorlaomer, and the thirteenth year they what? Rebel. So for, ever since then, the number 13 stands for rebellion. Rebellion. 13 stars and stripes on your dollar bill. All those, the 13 colonies, that eagle's got 13 arrows in his hand. They got 13 stripes on, on the flag. And then people say, well, that represented 13 colonies. Uh-uh. It come from over here on across the ocean that before that, that colony stuff ever got started. And there's 13 stamped all over that dollar bill, brother. And you know, the book said the love of money is the root of all evil. And that number 13, 85% of them in the Bible are connected with rebellion or something negative. And, and it, uh, this, this verse here contains two words that show up for the first time. Look at Genesis 13, 13 again. Two words that show up for the first time. One of them is wicked and the other is sinner. So the first time God mentions anything being, anybody being sinners is talking about sodomites, homosexuals. Somebody count the words in that verse. I'm guessing. I don't know. Somebody count the letters in homosexuality. Somebody count the letters in Sodom, Sodom, Gomorrah. It's 13. And God destroyed it with, with what? Brimstone and fire. Count the letters in brimstone and fire. Oh, yeah. We ain't, even, we ain't even scratched the surface. See, when, 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 when this book came off the press, God had his hand on this, y'all. He's had his hand on this book. This book will stand with worlds on fire. Listen, you are, you are cheating yourself big time by not spending a major amount of time of study in this book right here. I, I'm going to stop. I didn't even plan on talking this long. But I can show you place after place after place after place in these Bibles where it's got it all wrong. They come from a completely different set of manuscripts. Even the New King James. They claim the New King James is just clearing up the King James just a little bit, but you can find several readings in there that are come from this, this line of Bibles here. Okay? All right. I'm done for now. Let me see if I got a New King James here. I think I got one here somewhere. I was going to show you something. Nope. That's... Who is? DJ, that's what he carries? So I wound up in the mire. Oh, but the Derek's got his. Y'all heard about DJ, didn't you? That, that Bible talks about that he brought me up out of that miry clay, brother. <laughs> I had them down there working. They took most of the day off Friday, and I said, we're going to get some work done around here. We're going to get something done tomorrow, too. Tomorrow, either. They won't play basketball. We're going to have to work. And, uh, it sent DJ down there, weed eat down around the, the below the house, the pond, and there's a big creek going down through there. We well, got down in there, next thing went over, heard him hollering, 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 and he, he sunk up to here in that mud and he couldn't get out. And he's just stuck there. And I said, ah. I said, You give me your car and I'll we'll pull you out of there. And, and we laughed at him. He couldn't move. He couldn't move. I don't know if y'all ever been stuck, it's like quicksand, that old gray muck around the creek. So I got down there on one side of him. Ethan got on the other side of him. He put one arm around me and one. And we pulled and pulled. It's like trying to pull a, a, a beast of the field out of there, brother. I, I, and, and we, and we, I had him on my, and Tara and Mallory is up there laughing at us. But that was a sight to see, wasn't it? You should have got that on video. And, and we got him out of there and his boot was still down in there filled up with mud and water. It's awful. Uh, and I said, uh, you know what? I said, that's a type of sin right there. You get in sin, you just get deeper and deeper. First thing you know, you're stuck and you can't get out. You better listen to that. That'll preach, boys. Make your sermon out of that. You can't. You need brothers and sisters to help you get out of that mess. Amen. Uh, we we I threatened to leave him there. He was swinging that weed eater like that, man. Uh, he, he, he got to learn somehow. That's good. I've, I've been stuck in mud for like that. We drained a pond one time. I got down in there and got it. I couldn't get out. And that's the way sin is. You think you can get out. 
you can't. I was going to tell you another night quick, and I go, Gary's laughing about this, and Frankie, uh, he was, he was uh, I don't even know where he's at. Oh, there he is. Uh, he, uh, I was showing him those pictures of Dr. Ruckman drawing one of those Pontius Pilate sending Jesus back and forth, you know, and the way he draws them pictures, that's always got those Jews with that, that face, you know, and that just that jet black hair and cut like that. And he told, he told Kelly, he said, Mama, I didn't know God had a mullet. <laughs> that's a classic hair, brother. But, uh, amen. All right, anybody want to say something or ask something? Or you, want, you can get your stuff here. You, you get that stuff on why I believe the King James Bible, the Word of God. The one I did on the world's greatest book. There's a whole bunch more stuff. We just scratched the surface tonight. Let's stand. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for that we've been allowed to possess the greatest book that's ever been in the world. Lord, we thank you for our Bibles. Help us to love it, learn it, and live it. Help us not just to go around tooting our horn, saying we believe it. Help us to do something about it and practice it. Not just be here as the word, but do it. Help every one of us here this week to spend more time in the word of God than we ever have before. Lord, bless our church because it will be built upon the foundation of this book. In Jesus' name we pray. Give everybody a good week. Amen. All right. God bless you. See you all Wednesday night. Words to depend upon His word.